Okay. So y'all could all look at your program. So uh, Casey got the fun part. All right, so pass the song to the uh, headquarters Virginia Forces. This is a recruitment poster. You can see the date at the bottom, May 30, 1861. In Staunton, Virginia, May 30th, 1861. This is a little over a month at a battle of First Manassas. No Yankees were on Southern soil at the moment. All right, so what would they put in their recruitment poster? They hadn't started a draft yet. They were trying to motivate ordinary Southern men to join the Army. Now, how do you motivate an ordinary Southern man to join the Army? Well, we know how because that's what they did. Here's how you motivate an ordinary southern man to join the Confederate Army. Your soil has been invaded by your abolition foes, and we call upon you to rally at once and drive them back. That's the first sentence, right? Dear regular southern guys, you know who the bad guys are? It's abolitionists. That's, that's May of 1861, is defining the opposition as abolitionists. All right, uh, then, uh, oh yeah, you push down to the bottom. And it says, let us drive back the invading foot of a brutal and desperate foe, or leave a record to posterity that we die bravely defending our homes and firesides, the honor of our wives and daughters. From whom? From whom were they defending their wives and daughters? In May of 1861, from whom could a southerner defend his wife and daughter? There were no Yankees. There were no rumors of rapacious Yankees. Do you know where they could defend their wives and daughters from? Black men. That is the only object of fear. And this is the ordinary Confederate private who was motivated to join the army by that. Right? You can't get more direct. Right? If you put up a recruiting poster saying, please join our army for the following purpose, and you only have the one purpose, that's why people join. All right, flip over to the back. Now this is from the War Songs and Poems of the Southern Confederacy. You can see this was published in 1904 by a Southerner, Mr. Well, Dr. Horton, Dr. of Divinity. So this is on page 145, Lincoln's Troops. This was written by a gentleman, A.G. Goodwin. Now you can look at the little description. Don't read all the way down. Just look at the description at the top. In June 1865, a battalion of Texas Rangers arrived at Nashville and pitched its camp at the old fairgrounds. And then somebody wrote a song. So you know that something has gone wrong there because no battalion of Texas Rangers was anywhere near Nashville in June of 1865 because the war was over. However, you check around a little bit and you find that Perry's Texas Rangers was in Nashville in June of 1861. So it's a typo or somebody got a date wrong. All right, so Mr. Goodlett and Dr. William Minchin walked out to see this noted troop, and while seated on the amphitheater viewing them and arranging their camp, Goodlett wrote the following lines and handed them to Dr. Minchin, who at once began to sing them to the tune of Dixie. For a time, they were quite popular among the Tennessee boys, some of whom may recognize them today. Popular marching song, sung to the tune of Dixie. All right, let me see if I can get this right. Lincoln's troops, infatuated fools, taught in abolition schools, are coming south to pull their triggers, kill our boys and free our <laughs> Common marching song. So what's Lincoln boys coming down to do? Okay, Lincoln's troops are infatuated fools taught in what kind of schools? It's not tariff schools. It's not Federalist schools, it's not centralism schools, it's abolition schools. And they're coming south to pull their triggers, kill our boys, and do what? Free our who? All right, or ordinary marching song. All right, so you think, all right, words change their connotations over time. Right, in, in 2020, someone were to set up the American Negro College Fund, that would be really weird. Right, that's just not how we talk anymore. That word has not always been exactly a slur. Now it would be, at best, really weird. Uh, if in 2020 someone were to try to set up the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, we would, what the hell is wrong with you? That's extremely strange. Right, so how about this word? I'm not even gonna say it, and it's not because I think that you're all extremely sensitive, it's because I don't wanna show up on social media edited out of context. So what did that word mean in 1861? Right? Did it just mean black, or was it a slur already? And it was a slur already. Let's see. So, 
Here's a book written in 1837, a treatise on the intellectual character and civil and political condition of the colored people in the United States and the prejudice exercised toward them with a sermon on the duty of the church to them by Reverend H. Easton, a colored man. Right, so the book is written by someone who calls himself, on his own title page, a colored man. All right. Now he says, I have no language wherewith to give slavery and an auxiliaries and a, an adequate description as an efficient cause of the miseries it's capable of producing. It seems to possess a kind of omnipresence. It follows its victims in every avenue of life. The principle assumes still another feature equally destructive. It makes the colored people subserve almost every foul purpose imaginable. Negro or is an appropriate term employed to impose contempt upon them as an inferior race and also to express their deformity of person. So in 1837 it was understood to be a vile racist slur. I mean, this guy calls himself a colored man, but he says that it is a vile racist slur. Right, so there's a distinction there. All right, does it go back any further? It does. Now here is a song that the Redcoats sang during the American Revolution. It is called The Trip to Cambridge. Um, and I think it's actually sung to Yankee Doodle Dandy. So a trip to Cambridge, and we swing, I'm not gonna sing this entire song, I'm gonna sing almost none of it. Um, I will just point out that a white, W-I-G-H-T, if you've ever heard of a white, it's probably because you play Dungeons and Dragons or a Red Jair or Tolkien, um, but in this case, it's an extremely pale person. All right, so they're making fun of General Washington and his army who had apparently lost an awful lot of cattle or something to them. For many a child went into camp all dressed in hopes but courtesy to see the greatest rebel scamp that ever crossed our jersey. The rebel clowns are what a sight too awkward was their figure. This one just stood a pious white and here and there a new. Do you think that the red coats really were just saying, you know, here and there, there's a black guy. That's not, that's not what that meant. That was an insult, right? It was a slur. In 1776, that word was a slur. That's a hundred years before the Civil War. All right. Well, were those a couple of unusual cases? Now, here's Robert Burns, Scottish poet. Uh, and this was from the 1780s. So this is a poem called The Ordination. Uh, this is an extremely long poem. I'm gonna give you four lines from it. Um, in this poem, he is making fun of Calvinists for their extremely dire, gloomy kind of church services. And he says, Come, let a proper text be read, and touch it off with vigor. How graceless Ham laughed at his dad, which made Canaan a nin -nin -nin. All right, that is a reference to the Old Testament. Genesis. So in that particular reference to Genesis, this is right after the flood, God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant, which I've established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. All right, so what happened to make, father the, to make Ham the father of Canaan, and why would Robert Burns describe the Canaanites there as mm. These three, are, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them the whole earth overspread. Noah began to be a husbandman, he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered in his tent, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. In the Old Testament, you never really know what that means, right? Usually if you see somebody's nakedness, it means you have sex with them. I don't know what's going on here, but anyway, he did something untoward to his father while he was naked. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, told his two brethren, went out, and Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it both upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. So good for them. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. So that's why Robert Burns used that particular word. In Scotland in the 1780s, meant a person in a profoundly, permanently degraded, genetically determined condition. It's always been a slur. All right, that's Scotland in the 1780s. Let's run back a little bit longer. Letters of the late Ignatius Sancho, an African. So this is, oh, uh, a black guy who was writing to the novelist. Gosh, uh, Joseph Stern. Um, this is the guy who wrote The Life and Letters of Tristram Shandry. Um, which is a very famous novel that I have not read. Uh, but he was, apparently was a noted uh, minister and abolitionist. So, Sancho wrote to him, 
in 1766. And he wrote to this abolitionist, asking for support for abolitionism, Reverend Sir, it would be an insult on your humanity, or perhaps look like it, to apologize for the liberty I'm taking. I'm one of those people whom the vulgar and illiberal call as That's the 1760s. And already the vulgar and illiberal are the ones who use this word. So when the ordinary Southern soldier was singing it all across the South in 1861, it was a vile, racist slur then. That didn't happen since 1861. Words change their meanings, so you have to check what exactly that meant in 1861. But then you check, and it was already a nasty racist slur. All right, that's what they were fighting for. They all signed up because of a recruitment poster told them to fight against abolitionists, and then they walked around talking about, well, chanting vile racist slurs all across the South. So guys, this morning uh, we had the opportunity to talk to Williams County Commissioner's Court, and, and uh, I love this quote by Martin Luther King. The arc of the moral universe is long. No, but it bends towards justice. All right, we have a committee forming in October that is supposed to form in October that will assess the appropriateness of the statue existing here on a place that's supposed to stand for justice, equality, and liberty. Right? So, as was said, try and get with your whoever your elected representative is from wherever you are so that you have a say in what happens with this statue. Right? If, if a statue to edify traitors and white supremacists is where we feel our values are at a place that's supposed to stand for liberty and justice, well then we need to have a totally another conversation. All right? So, let's have a little conversation, let's do a little call and response, okay? I'm gonna say America first, you're gonna say Confederacy never, I'm gonna say liberty and union, you will then say now and forever, okay? So let's try it out real quick. America first. Confederacy never. Liberty and union. Now and forever. America first. Liberty and Union. America first. Liberty and Union. America first. Liberty and Union. 